Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. That's the first law of technology. According to Melvin Kranzberg, he was an American professor and a historian in technology uh, back in the Cold War. He wanted to push back against this idea of technological determinism, which was prevalent at the time. This idea that technology inevitably follows a specific path and it shapes humanity in predetermined ways. Um, and we're seeing a lot of resurgence of that kind of thinking around AI with lots of uh, predictions of doom. Um, but he argued that if you want to understand any technology, then you've got to understand human agency. You've got to understand what humans decide to do with it. And they can do different things with it. And I would argue that his ideas are more relevant today than ever. I should probably explain where I am. I'm here on the western tip of Latvia, surrounded by beautiful forest. But this used to be a top secret Soviet military base during the Soviet occupation of the Baltic countries. And about 2,000 military personnel and their families used to live here. I'm gonna show you why. I'm gonna show you the technology that they put here and also who's now in charge of it. Mr. Pop. This base was known as Starlet. It was a listening station for intercepting communications in the West. As this photo taken by an American satellite. This is Arnis, who agreed to show me around. Starlet is home to the largest satellite dish in Northern Europe, as well as a few smaller ones. You've just got to be a bit careful walking on them, as I discovered. A bit slippy. Yeah, all oh, okay. Yeah, just when I was starting to feel like James Bond. So in total in base was living 2,000 people, uh, 300 officers with their families, and 500 uh, conscript soldiers. Officers, yeah, was uh, from Russia, but conscript soldiers was from Baltic states. When the Russian army was being kicked out of Latvia in 1994, they tried to destroy anything they couldn't take back to Russia with them. They poured acid into the machinery, cut cables, and took a sledgehammer to equipment. But the Latvian Academy of Sciences quickly moved in and began restoring the site, which is now under the management of nearby Ventspils University, which is who Arnis works for. They did lots of renovations, not just fixing the satellite dishes, but also putting up new science buildings, bringing in new equipment, and getting rid of the most unstable old buildings. Find someone who looks at you like a Latvian looks at Soviet shit being blown up. <laughs> the Russians took away all the recordings made at the station, except one. This tape was found inside one of the buildings being prepared for demolition. It was carefully recovered, and for the first time, we can hear the communications that were intercepted by the station. Now, what do you think it was? Confidential discussions between world leaders? communications with nuclear submarines? No. Anyone who had to live under the Soviet Union can probably already guess some of the most advanced Soviet technology was being used to pirate Western music. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. <laughs> the group name, The Twins. Uh -huh. <laughs> song named Bella Dancer. This is German synth pop, which briefly reached number 19 in the German charts in 1983. But hang on a sec, the Latvians aren't spying on the West. So what did they restore this facility for? They decided to give the technology something socially responsible to do. The Latvian scientists were like, I think needs to learn how to adapt, Murph, like the rest of us. So they pointed the satellites to the stars instead and now use it to explore space. Receiving electric magnetic waves from stars, galactic quasars, 
and other cosmical objects that's out there. So there's usually one main question, and this question usually is about these guys. Uh -huh. Everybody asking me, are there aliens out there? So that is the main question. And my answer is, sorry guys, I'm not allowed to talk about them yet. <laughs> More recently, the Latvians have invested millions here into new generation state-of-the-art antennas. Calling low, bar, low frequency RI. And with this one, we're also making the measurements. This is part of a huge pan-European network of more than 50 such stations. It's the most powerful technology of its kind, and it's right now helping map the universe and unlock its secrets for humanity. Because you need really huge antennas to hear all the noises that's coming from the universe. Kranzberg's last rule of technology is that technology is a very human activity, and so is the history of technology. My visit to Starlet really helped me reflect on that reality. Nothing in this world is inevitable, not in geopolitics, not in technology, not in anything else. You can't understand the world if you don't respect human agency and seek to understand it. And yet it's increasingly popular, both in academia and the real world, for people to believe that human agency doesn't matter. Like when supporting aggression against entire nations they think don't matter. Now, some of the warnings about AI are coming from some of the same people. So I'm not an AI doomer. I'm also not an AI optimist. I don't think we should use these kind of labels. I, I think AI is nuanced, like pretty much everything else in the world. We can get a lot of good out of this technology. Uh, there's also a lot of harm that people can cause with it. It's going to be developed. We just need to make sure that it's well regulated, that uh, democracies are... Uh, having a, at least a seat at the table in steering this thing globally. That means in order to help regulate AI, we also need to be leading on AI. We also need to have the industry here. One thing that the uh, so-called AI doomers like to say is, look, if a plane had a 2% chance of crashing, would you get on that plane? And no, to be fair, I wouldn't. But that's not comparable to the reality we face with AI. Uh, to, to make that analogy more accurate to the reality right now with AI, you are already on that plane. The question is, who do you want at the controls? Do you want a qualified, trained pilot at the controls? Or do you want a, uh, a drunk passenger to take over? A, a passenger who's been abusing all the other passengers? That's the reality we face with AI. Do we want democratic countries to help regulate and help steer the course of AI and ensure that we have more good AI that benefits uh, the public good and drives innovation? Uh, or do we want to, to give it up in the free world and let autocratic regimes continue to use AI for harmful purposes? If you want to talk about apocalyptic AI, then you don't have to look into the far future. Just invite Uyghurs to your panel. The Riga genocide is both enabled by AI and enabling the further development of AI. But you won't hear about this in debates about AI because that would mean challenging how actual humans use the technology now, which can be awkward if you are dependent on them for market access. It's easier to talk about AI as this great power unto itself, especially if you're also not clear what value your own AI offers you right now. If you can't talk about the Riga genocide, or if you won't talk about it, then you don't know the first thing about the risk of AI. When the Latvians kicked out the Soviets, uh, they showed that human agency does matter, that we can shape our own future. So thank you for watching wherever in the world you are and always remember that you matter, even in the age of AI.